Mia Burke is the president of Alta Planning and Design. She spent her entire career creating active communities where bicycling and walking are safe, healthy, fun, accessible, and part of normal daily life. As the president of Alta Planning, she's been a principal at Alta Bike Sickle Share Inc., authoring a number of, I think, periodicals over time, uh, articles and columns, but especially this book called Joyride, Pedaling Toward a Different Planet. By the way, we have 20 copies up here, and uh, Mia's agreed after she finishes to sign those for those who want to buy one. Well, I know we're going to run out because there are 150 people that are participating today. So we may have more that we'll need for the charrette in a couple of weeks because she'll, her team will be coming back. Mia has been at the forefront of numerous groundbreaking studies and organizations. She was the co-founder of Portland State University's Initiative for Bicycle and Pedestrian Innovation and the Cities for Cycling Project and the Urban Bikeway Design Guide of the National Association of City Transportation Officials. She's also very active in many activities in the Portland region, operates public bike sharing systems in, both in Washington, D.C., Boston, and other places. Mia happens to live and rides bicycles with her three children and, and many members of the community in Portland. She's a friend of the state of Oregon and a friend of the state of California, Mia Burke. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for that warm introduction. I appreciate that. And thank you all for having me here. What a beautiful region. And I was intending to come with my husband and uh, two of my kids and spend the weekend, but we had some family illnesses, so they couldn't come with me. But we're going to come back um, as soon as possible. <laughs> it's beautiful here. So this is, a, this is the moment where we're going to dream and laugh and learn and, and, overcome, and figure out how do we overcome the obstacles. There are many that are standing in our way to getting what we want here. So we're going to talk about trails as a journey. Because every trail is a journey. It could be the point to point, or it could be circular. It could be a meandering trail. It could be paved or unpaved or a mixture. It's on a utility corridor. It's along a creek or a river or a highway or maybe on roads. And mo most certainly, the trail will cross roads at some point. On this journey, you might see wildlife or urban life. Your mind might wander and your pulse might race. Um, for sure, you will smile. Behind each of these experiences, another journey happened. The journey that led to the trail's creation. For sure, that journey involved people like you, champions and leaders both within and outside of government. Now, obviously, this region is on a journey, this unique moment in time that you're on as you define the future and what you want to become. And this is, I understand, not for the first time that this has happened in this region. Uh, we've seen the rise and fall of the fishing industry and the creation and then the uh, closing of the Army base. And these were big, bold visions that helped define the region at, at those times. And it shows the strength of the people and the region to recover and change over time. Next month, the community des uh, charrette design process uh, will be yet another opportunity to help def define the vision for the next big, bold steps in the future. Now, you're all here because you believe in this region and you know that it has great potential and opportunity. We heard those words, potential and opportunity, a lot last fall when the Regional Urban Design Guidelines team met with a number of you, community members, and asked, what is the one word that comes to mind about your community today? However, the words that people said were on, are on this slide. We heard a lot of blight, inaccessible, and underused. But when we asked, what is the word that comes to mind about your community in the future, you used words like community, destination, and vibrant. 
So there's a gap between where this region sees itself today and where it sees itself in the future. And the journey is about bridging that gap. Now, a little about me. My own journey began in Texas, Dallas, Texas. Anybody been there? Or to the airport? (laughs) A very auto-oriented place, that Dallas, Texas. Yes. Um, Actually, the slide that you showed about Phoenix, exact same thing in Dallas. Oh, I was working on the trail, Katy Trail there. They're building trails. It's very nice. They're building trails. Um, And they're doing a lot of infill. Oh, but in the meantime, they went ahead and widened the main highway ring road around and added a whole nother toll road ring road. Oh, and then another one and another one and another one. So it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, but in a place like Dallas, um, by the time I was a teenager, I was like 40% of today's youth, overweight and depressed. And then unique to Texas would be the big hair, which... You know, because as they say in Texas, the bigger the hair, the closer to God. (laughs) As you can see, this was not, that was not natural. You can see that. So when I was heading for graduate school in Washington, D.C., later on, my brother, Bruce, said, take my bike. And I said, now, why would I take your bike? What? And he says, Miss So-Called Environmentalist. And it's true, I was studying international economics and and energy and the environment, so he had a point. And he said, why don't you get off your lazy butt? Maybe you'll stop whining about being so fat. So nothing like a little sibling heckling to get the blood flowing, right? So I said, fine, I will take your bike. I will do that. That is exactly what I'll do. So I got myself a a 10-speed Schwinn, and I started uh, riding in Washington, D.C., and the first um, week I was there, I was riding up 18th Street into Adams, uh, into Adams Morgan. Anybody know that area in D.C.? Kind of into Mount Pleasant. And I couldn't, it's not that much of a hill, actually. No. You know what I'm saying. It's not really a hill. But I couldn't get up that hill that wasn't really a hill. And so I got off and started pushing my bike. But, you know, I kept at it. And, um, and pretty soon I had lost weight. And I just felt, it wasn't so much about the weight. I just felt good. You know, I, could, I felt really great. I had a lot of energy. And at this point, I'd spent a small fortune on gym memberships and diet plans. They're like, it's like going on dates with people that you don't like and being stuck with the bill over and over and over again, those diet plans. But bicycling didn't feel like exercise because I was just getting where I needed to go. So I moved out to Tacoma Park, 14 miles away through beautiful Rock Creek Park and along the trail there and, um, and the U.S. National Mall and, and over to my office at Union Station. And so 100 miles a week of pedaling sculpted my calves into like this Tina Turner-esque beautiful legs and, and I could hardly believe they were mine. I looked good and I felt even better and the insecure young woman who had struggled with her weight in the past was, was gone. Now, my first job out of graduate school was researching international transportation issues. In fast-growing Asian and Latin American cities, I saw massive investments being poured into road building. And the results in places like Bangkok, some of you have been there, thick congestion, horrific air pollution, health and safety problems. And in European and Japanese cities, where the emphasis was on transit, walking, bicycling, congestion went down, and health and safety improved. Light bulbs went off in my head. At the crossroads of my personal transformation and sustainable transportation stood a win-win solution, the bicycle. Not the only solution, you understand, but a part of the solution. And with this epiphany came clarity. I wanted to transform American cities into bicycle-friendly places. And with that clarity came luck. I landed the job of bicycle coordinator for the city of Portland, Oregon. Now, my family was less than thrilled. My stepfather, Tommy, from Texas, said, uh, this environmental crap is for y'all hippies. Americans are not going to ride bicycles. Now, he had a point. 
For 100 years, we have designed our communities around the car, and we have cemented our addiction to driving through land use development, traffic management, use of public space, building codes, building design. And the prospect of overcoming a century of car-oriented social engineering, welcome students, come on in, uh, seemed preposterous, even in Portland, which was not bike-friendly in 1993. Now, who's been to Portland? Many of you have been to Portland. So you, you come into Portland, and you think, oh, it's a super bicycle place, right? It's just always been that way. That's just how it is. People just woke up in Portland one day, and there were bicycles everywhere just because of the beer that people drink, right? That must be what it is. Um, but this is a myth. This is a myth. Like anything you want to do in life, to make change happen, you actually have to make change happen. And Portland took a long, long time to become the city that it is. Um, now, for years, I hauled around a bike trail. This is actually what Portland looked like back then. I mean, most of the roads look like this. There were basically no bike lanes. Um, and we had a few bike paths, but they weren't very good. And uh, I was working with some businesses. I was trying to change the building code to require better bike parking. Somebody mentioned bike parking this morning. You have to have bike parking at your destination. It's critical. And the businesses said, oh, we don't need bike parking. Mia, we already have bike parking, lots of bike parking. Uh, and we will install more bike parking as soon as people start to use that bike parking. And I would say, guys, look at these pictures. There is bike parking, it's true. But it's not, it's not actually very good. It's not very accessible. And in fact, this one is on the third floor of the parking garage behind the dumpster. So we may want to rethink that. And then they would say, look, you can't force us to put in bike parking. That's a government taking. That's a government over, over, its, uh, over its boundaries. Um, because bicycling is, is like, um, it's, it's, it's like a toy. Or it's like a sport, like skiing. So what are you going to make us put in next? Ski racks? You're going to make us put in toy chests? So what they looked at was the bicycle, as we all know, which it is a sport, a very fine sport that many of us love, and that's a good thing. And it is a toy because many of us ride as a kid, and we, it puts a smile on our face. So in fact, it's kind of toy-like, and that's a good thing. But it also can be and is a serious means of transportation in many parts of the world and for many of the cities in the United States at this point. So, and, but we faced a lot of resistance from the media, from the school districts, from the businesses, uh, and it was really challenging. So we had a long, long way to go. So for years, I hauled around a bike trailer and a, and a slide projectors, two of them, with those trays. Some of you remember this, not the students. They don't know what I'm talking about, but some of us know, right? Right, with the carousels, and then you had to put the slides in upside down and backwards, and they would frequently get jammed. So I hauled those around, in my bike, and I had two bike trailers, and hauled those around, and I'd have posters, and I'd have coupons, and I'd have maps, and I had a lot of safety information, and we'd have surveys. And I would talk about the high cost of motor vehicle infrastructure and congestion and the health consequences of sedentary lifestyle. So this is kind of the bummer part of the presentation. And I get everybody very, very depressed. And then we go move on to the good news. We can change this. We can make things better. And I'd show examples from Denmark and the Netherlands. And I'd talk about the need for a comprehensive bikeway system and describe the options that were available, what's in our toolkit that we can do in cities. We can put in bike lanes. Uh, at, this at that time, we really, that's all we did was we put in bike lanes. Now we would put in a, a protected bike lane. We would buffer it. We would make it a lot better. But at that time, we were just really trying to get a bike lane in. We'd talk about neighborhood greenways or bicycle boulevards on neighborhood streets, which is a huge opportunity. You see a lot of these in Palo Alto. Some of you have seen them. In Berkeley, there's a bunch of them. Um, and we talk a lot about the, the good, you know, connecting those paths and making really beautiful off-street paths in beautiful areas. We talk about really good bike parking, covered bike parking, secure bike parking. We talk about education, kids, adults, people on bikes, people in cars, people walking. And we talk about encouragement and we talk about enforcement. And all together, we had a community conversation that went on similar to what you're doing here for about two years with numerous charrettes, lots of public engagement. It was like um, you know, an ongoing public dis discourse or dialogue about our future. 
And all in all, we adopted then a visionary, bold bike plan that many of the communities here have. Um, we did work regionally with other parts of the region on how these would connect, which is a big issue here. Uh, and we adopted this big, bold, visionary bike plan of a 630-mile bikeway network with an official policy, make the bicycle an integral part of daily life. That was 1996. So at this point, we set about adding uh, hundreds of miles of bikeways very, very quickly, growing the network by shaving off a foot or two here and there off of travel lanes. Sometimes we'd swap a travel lane for two bike lanes, as in this slide. And um, in the meantime, my colleague in the Parks Bureau, George Hudson, who's my uh, current business partner at Alta, uh, who joined me at two, the year 2000, he set about adding trails. Now, the rest of this presentation is going to be largely about trails. And as we discussed, as, um, as uh, Josh discussed earlier, trails can take many forms. They can be on road, they can be off road, they can be separated, they can be a mixture of things. And, and so, you know, the, the, the word we're using here today is fairly broad. So back to all of you who have been to Portland. Many of you have probably been on this trail, which is the East Bank Esplanade. It floats in the river, and it's quite a marvel. But it wasn't always there. Once upon a time, the Willamette River, which is in the heart of downtown Portland, was a river freeway. River commerce ruled the day in Portland, Oregon. And as time wore on, the Willamette River became a toxic stew keeping boats afloat but devastating all its living creatures and degrading its majesty. And this story is a very common one in the United States, that we, we had a natural resource and we, we, we dirtied it up. We used it badly. And jumping on the river destruction bandwagon at this moment was the Federal Highway Administration, which was in the, the phase of investing lots and lots of money in, in miles of highways all across the country. Now, one of these highways, and you can see it in the picture right here, was plopped down right next to the Willamette in the heart of downtown in one tremendous example of short-sighted use of prime riverfront property. It took no time at all for the city officials to realize what a lemon they were stuck with, and for the next two, three decades, the city council debated over and over and over whether to bury it, blow it up, move it, replace it. And finally, in the early 1990s, the leadership basically gave up. They said, we can't, we can't touch this beast. We're just going to have to live with it. And we're going to find, figure out a way to recapture this um, prime, beautiful space. So my colleague George Hudson led this design team, and, it, and he immediately realized that this was a very complicated project. And it's similar to, I see all of the people in this room who are from so many different jurisdictions, from the cities to the BLM and the, you know, the state agencies, the federal agencies, the local agencies, the county. You know, you've got a lot of different cooks in the kitchen here, and very similarly, there were about 30 different cooks in the kitchen regulating various parts of the Willamette River. So extremely, extremely complicated and extremely expensive to deal with all those complications. For example, there were nesting bald eagles on an island downstream from the heart of where this trail would be, and so the construction window couldn't be any time near the uh, nesting season of the bald eagles. There were um, endangered coho salmon in the river, and so you also had to avoid the spawning season when, dis when any uh, construction that could impact the river would potentially disturb the, um, the, um, this, the fish. So there was a, the, and that's just a few examples of the many, many, many challenges in working through this. But George did that. He worked through all of these challenges for a decade and raised a lot of money and worked through all the challenges. And so um, late 1990s, he had two hurdles left to overcome. The first one is reflected in this picture, where the freeway gobbles up the riverbank, as you can see here. This is the freeway uh, fence. George and his team floated the path on one. There's not enough room here to put a trail on the bank, so he, right here. So he floated the trail on 150-foot tall spires pounded deep into the river's bed. When you walk or bike on this trail in this portion, you're in perfect harmony with the river's tidal flow because the, tra the trail itself floats up and down with the tides on the spires. 
And it's one of the, it's about 1,200 feet, and it's one of the longest of its kind in the United States. But there was a problem, and that is that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said that there's a type of fish called the northern squawfish that was going to gather below this now new object in the river that's going to be dark, and they're going to gather below the floating walkway, and they're going to prey on the endangered steelhead smolt, the endangered fish. They're going to de- they're going to eat the little babies. And so the the Fish and Wildlife Service basically handed George a bill and said, you're going to pay us for every smolt that is eaten by these nasty squawfish. So the one problem with this is, there's a couple problems with this. One is that George is a fisherman, and so he's very, very aware of what type of fish, and he's a conservationist fisherman, so he's very aware of what kinds of fish are out there, and what, and he is, and he is, there has never been a squawfish sighted in the Willamette River. So he basically said, I'm not going to pay for these fish. So that was, that was one battle. The second battle, but he did agree, actually, to push the floating walkway way further out into the river so that it wouldn't be as dark and gloomy, uh, which cost more money and, and created more additional challenges. And he had one more pr- problem, which was he was missing a critical permit, which grants permission to build the path on the state property that is sandwiched between the freeway and the eroding riverbank. And so in the meantime, he had to develop these new bioengineering techniques uh, to build up and preserve the riverbank with native vegetation. So that was actually really cool. But the state transportation department wouldn't give him the permit until the Army Corps of Engineers gave their permit, and they wouldn't give their permit until the state transportation department gave their permit. So we were, he was like stuck in this kind of um, bureaucratic limbo that happens, right? I mean, it happens. I think we've all experienced it, and some of us have probably been part of it as, as, uh, tr- as officials ourselves, <laughs> and we're not, we, don't, we mean well, right? But this happens when you have conflicting um, rules. And in the meantime, he's got this really narrow construction window because of the nesting bald eagles, so he has to get this permit. Construction crews are ready, and he's got to get these permits. So he finally got the core permit, which was conditional upon the state transportation permit, and he got in his car and drove down to the capital of Oregon, Salem. He goes to the guy's office, and the guy is not there. He finds out he's having a meeting, and he goes and stands outside the door of the meeting room, sticks his head around so the guy can see him in the window, and the guy ignores him completely, and he stands there for an hour waiting for the guy to come out. He came out of the room, and he scoots down the hall. He like disappears so fast, it's like Wile E. Coyote pouncing on the rabbit, on Bugs Bunny. Whoop, empty air. So he, he shadows him down the hall and follows them into the men's room. And then he waits, and the guy does his business, and he washes his hands, and George stands by the door and literally hands him the permit and a pen. And that's how he finally got that permit for the East Bank Esplanade on the river. And we say that you know bur- this whole project was birthed in sewage and sludge. And birthed in sewage and sludge, the East Bank Esplanade was blessed for creation in another waste treatment zone, the bathroom. <laughs> now from the, day, from the day the mile and a half Esplanade opened, Uh, People on bike ride their bikes, and joggers run, and and, and people are out there walking and enjoying, and it's, it's the the path is beautiful. It's graceful curves, and it's vegetation, and it's art, and it's um, interpretive panels, and it's views do exactly what the city council intended, which is it distracts you from the freeway. The freeway's there. It's right there, and it's pretty loud, but it just sort of distracts you. And, and George's floating walkway is the show-stopping masterpiece, and if you go out there, next time you come to Portland, you put your hand on one of these spires and you can feel the river moving beneath you. And you can say that you walked on water. But now that the path is open for business, and this is the year 1999, I think. Uh, No, 2000, 2000. Now that the path is open, 2001. Now that the path is open for business, um, now we're getting serious about the squawfish situation, okay? And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife is is very persistent in saying we need to take care of this. And George, however, very stubborn, is unwilling to give up. So he takes a crew out there with nets, and they start sweeping underneath the floating walkway, and they don't come up with any squawfish. Uh, He he sends a team with um, electric shock devices 
to try to shock the fish and get them to come up, and that doesn't work. And, and he played music to them, and he fed them all their favorite foods. And that didn't work either. And there were no squawfish under. So one time a sheriff told me that the bad guys are like cockroaches. If you shine a light on them, they scatter. And we think that the squawfish must have taken one look at the East Bank Esplanade and fled in terror because they were so thoroughly and utterly dazzled by the happy vibe from all those people. Now sometimes a trail is a pathway to something else. Let me give you an example. Now this is another one of George's masterpieces in Portland. This is the Springwater Corridor, which is a 16 mile long uh, rail to trail, an abandoned tra rail railroad that was uh, created into a trail. And actually there's fiber optic cable buried underneath it. We were talking about that last night. So that's another, uh, and so the, actually the company's paid for a portion of it. So it's a, a way to raise money for the trail. And so one day I was riding with um, the head of the transit agency. His name's Tom Walsh. And it was actually kind of a planned ride. Um, I had purchased at a charity auction a ride with the director of TriMet, and I had an intention. And the intention was to talk to him about the situation with the transit agency. It was very bike unfriendly in Portland, Oregon, yes. This is before there were racks on buses. There were no racks on the buses. There were restrictions on taking your bike on the train. You could, there was a new light rail line, and you could only take your bike on the train not during rush hour, which is the time that you would want to take your bike on the train. Uh, there was virtually no space. Um, there was all, virtually no bike parking at any stations. And then there were these brand new low, car, low floor cars that they were about to unveil that were, you know, so low floor so you don't have to climb up a stairs, right? And they were very excited that they were going to have um, space for bicycles, but when we went to look at that space for bicycles on these cars, we found that the space was really um, a sticker in the, on the little door right next to the aisle. So if you brought a bike in, you would be blocking the aisle. And we were sort of baffled by why this would be such a good idea when we could put hooks in the car. We could do so many things that are being done in so many other progressive cities. And as far as I could tell, I mean, you could take a stroller or anything larger on the train without restriction, but you had all these restrictions if you were taking a bike on it. And so as far as I could tell, there was no good reason. And people on bike were being treated as a very special class of bozos. And I couldn't figure out why a person, by virtue of, of their use of a bicycle, would be considered any more or less discourteous than, than anybody else, just by virtue of having a bicycle. So I arranged this ride with Tom, and when we were riding, I showed him how we had gotten a traffic signal. Oh, I don't have it. Do I? Yes, I do. Installed at a busy five-lane highway. Now, I, this is an interesting intersection for, for you guys, because it has pedestrian push buttons. There's a median island in the middle, so you can stop on this busy roadway halfway if you need to. And there's an equestrian push button. Yes, and I know some of you are, uh, acknowledge that this is important. So the, um, the equestrian pu push button is up at the height that you would be if you were on a horse. So that was, I think that was, that was the first one of its kind in this country, I think. I could be wrong. So all those things, and then there was a bike loop detector for, for people on bike, and so it was a really well designed. And so here's the interesting story behind this, is that initially we had asked the highway department, this is State Highway, for permission to, to do this, and the first response was no, you can't do it. It doesn't meet warrants, and warrants are the, the you have to, it has to warrant disrupting traffic, and there's a whole, um, uh, formula related to the warrants, and some of you who are in the traffic world know it's in the, the manual on uniform traffic control devices, and it's, it's kind of a catch-22 because you have to prove that you have X amount of traffic uh, to justify, justify uh, disrupting the flow traffic, but if you don't have anybody biking or walking now because the trail doesn't exist, then it's very hard to meet warrants. Do you see what I'm saying? It's a catch-22. And you can't, so we did a projection based on the experience of the Burt Gilman Trail in Seattle, which shows uh, that in the future, as soon as we open this trail, we're going to actually have a lot of people on bike and foot crossing this street. But it's, at this point, that number, that projection still wasn't high enough to meet warrants based on the current standards. Um, and so then our city traffic engineer came up with a new idea. He came up with a brilliant idea, which is he classified the Springwater Corridor as a local road because the warrant threshold for local roads is lower than it is for a trail or a crossing at a school. 
So um, that worked. He declared it a local road, and he was able to get permission from the state highway department. So Tom, I was telling this story to Tom Walsh as we sit at this intersection. He said, wow, that is, I really didn't know that. That's a great story. Thank you. And then I told him, OK, but I'm really here to talk to you about something else. And I explained what's going on with TriMet. And he, he says, look, people can't, it's, there's going to be liability problems. And there's going to be safety problems. And we just can't allow people to bring their bikes on the, on the trains. And we can't have hooks and, and, and such and such. So I say, Tom, OK, well, let me tell you another story. And I tell him Tooker Gomberg's story. Now, Tooker um, was the bike coordinator for the city of Montreal. And at that time, the city of Montreal excluded bicyclists 100% from the subway system in Montreal. They got a very good subway system. And one day, uh, Tooker gathered a few friends. And one of them had a twin boys in a five foot long baby stroller. One of them brought his cello. And one of them brought a load of rebar. <laughs> what do all these have in common? They're about the length of a bicycle, about six, six feet long. And they all got on one by one. And Tooker was very clever because he brought the media with him as well. And he um, tried to walk on with his bicycle. And of course, he was denied access. And this made for a very nice media story. And very quickly, the uh, media, the, the, very quickly, the, the policy was reversed. So Tom, I tell the story to Tom, and he says, oh, well, yeah, I, I see your point. Why don't you put it in writing? And I'll see what I can do. So I gathered all of the people from the region. Um, Portland has 27 cities and three counties. So I gathered all the people from the region that might be able to help out with this. And in a, a collective um, act of regional unity, we sent a letter to Tom Walsh, very politely saying that we would like a test. I'm very fond of tests. I'm very fond of demonstration projects and tests um, and so the test was going to be, let's allow people with, to come on the train with their bicycles at all hours, with no restrictions, and stand anywhere they want, including in the area that is um, available for people with disabilities. When there's a person there with a disability, the person with the bicycle will move, just like any other person on the train. And so we will allow this, and we will have volunteers that are recording this information, and we will see what the result is. And of course, as you can imagine, they did this test for three months, and they found that the people on bicycles were no more or less courteous than anybody else. Um, and in fact, they, they found that the people on the bikes were actually quite courteous, that it was, it, there were no problems. And they, as a result, changed, changed their minds. And they eliminated all restrictions. And so I think. My experience has been, this is a great way to get decisions made, is to get out on bike with people in your community um, and see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, it's like, uh, we used to make a lot of deals on the golf course. I'm sure some of you probably do. Now I think the best way that to make a deal is to go out for a long bike ride. And they, by the way, eventually added hooks to the cars. OK, how am I doing for time? Okay, in 1999, uh, so I was at the city of Portland from 1993 to 1999. That's when I was working in the city government. And I left the city in 1999. Uh, I had my first child then, and I needed a change. And I joined forces with a very small consulting firm at the time, two-person shop out of San Rafael, California, called, now called Alta Planning and Design. Uh, and one of the very first projects was this project, this study of rails with trails. And my business partner, Michael Jones, said, I've got this little study for you. It's for the federal government. It's for the federal USDOT. Uh, we're going to study trails next to active railway lines. Um, and it stemmed from a project in Southern California called the Coastal Rail Trail. There were a group of advocates as well as a group of local governments who wanted to have a trail next to the rail line in Southern California. And to the railroad companies that own the rail line, this idea was not so good. It was about as popular as uh, New Coke. The Ford Pinto, guns and roses comeback attempt. Basically, the initial reaction was um, buzz off, not interested. And in fact, they were so incensed, they lobbied the Federal Railroad Administration for a national ban on trails on or adjacent to active railway lines. So Michael convinced the uh, USDOT that instead of an outright ban, a better approach would be to study it. Let's work on looking at the lessons learned all throughout North America and beyond on trails that are co-located on or adjacent to active railway lines. And so he said, um, he gave this study to me to take on. And, uh, and I said, extremely naively, sure, sounds good. I don't know anything about this, but no problem. I'll just go meet with the railroads, and we'll just 
work it all out. So I think, you know, being naive is a, is, is a certain, um, I don't know if it's an asset or not, but <laughs> I jumped in feast, feet first and then four years later came up for air, and <laughs> uh, but I learned a lot. And so first I learned is why is the railroad so opposed to trails on or even adjacent to their property? Why is that? So I went to these conferences. Has anybody heard of Operation Lifesaver? Right, so you know their responsibility and their work as a nonprofit is to keep people off the tracks. Stop, look, and listen uh, is their big campaign. And that, that group is actually formed by the families of um, train conductors who have killed people. Because when a train comes across somebody that is drunk, who has fallen down on the tracks, or stalled out car, or hanging out on a trestle, there's not much they can do. And um, other than being actually in the military or being a police officer, there, is, there, is very, there are very few jobs where you are almost guaranteed that in your career you are going to kill someone. And it is extremely, it is a PTSD kind of experience, not just for the conductor, but for their families. It is extremely um, emotionally damaging. So I learned this as I went to this conference. And I'm showing my slides and I'm saying, oh, we've got trail, there's 60. There were 60 trails in this country at that time that were co-located on or adjacent to active railway lines. There were many more in Canada. There were many more in Europe and New Zealand. I'm showing all these pictures and, you know, and I show this picture of a trestle. I think I've got it, do I have it? Yeah, I show this picture of these kids on the tracks. And I'm saying, oh, it's romantic. People think of, tra of, of uh, railroads as very romantic. It's like Norman Rockwell, you know, the kids fishing off a trestle. And this guy stands up and he, he describes how he was coming up to a trestle and he saw a guy lying on the tracks. And there was no way that he could stop. And the guy got up slowly and literally looked him in the eye. It was a suicide. And how devastating this was to him. And he said, how dare you show a picture like this at this conference? Um, this is not romantic from their perspective. And then I explained, well, what we're trying to do is actually get people off the tracks. Because in most communities, the railroads came in first and they took beautiful linear corridors next to the beach. And people are trying to get to the beach. And so they're crossing the tracks already. And they're walking along the tracks already. And if we can create trails, in these very uh, these attractive nuisance situations, then we can make it safer for everyone. And eventually, he invited me to come out with him to the East Bay, because running the train along the East Bay when the fog comes in, they can't see anything, and they're very very afraid of the notion that we would put a trail in that area. But once he got used to the idea that the trail will actually get people off the tracks, it became a whole different conversation. Now, at the time, as we were doing the study, we knew there was only one known incident in the entire world of uh, rails with trails of uh, anybody getting seriously injured on a rail with trail. And that was in Alaska, where a boy had crawled underneath a chain link fence that was kind of ripped and tried to jump on a moving train. So it really wasn't the trail itself that had anything to do with it. And there are protections in every state uh, to allow folks to build these trails. And once we went through this record, we, we started really making inroads and having folks like that conductor say, how can we help? We want to be part of this. We want to be part of the solution. So the net results of the study, which you can look up online, Rails with Trails Lessons Learned, is that properly designed Rails with Trails can reduce trespassing and vandalism and nuisance crimes. And they can be win-win solutions for both the railroad and the trail proponents and agencies. Now down in San Diego, or this one. These facts did very little to advance the Coastal Rail Trail. In fact, the lead railroad official dug in her heels. And not one of the 100 American, European, or Australian trails that we've studied is relevant in her mind. They're completely irrelevant. And so she commissions a video showing a 20-pound, girl-like, round-bottom, blow-up mannequin. So imagine a large weeble, weighted down by sand. So it's like a you know, a blow-up thing, that you, like a punching bag kind of thing. And, ne and he, she puts it next to the train, and as the train goes by, zooming by at high speed, the little girl got knocked over, and her red scarf went floating down the train tracks. 
So it's kind of a propaganda piece, right? So we go out there, we were hired by the regional government to uh, look into this, and we did a real life test. We brought out real life humans, a 70 pound 10 year old, the son of one of my colleagues, and we um, stood 15 feet from the tracks, and then 30 feet from the tracks, and then 50 feet from the tracks, and measured the wind velocity using wind velocity meters at all these points. And what we learned is that um, at 15 feet away from the tracks, with no barriers, the wind and the debris and sound impacts for high-speed rail was noticeable, although not destabilizing. And at 30 feet, it was just a breeze. So we presented this to the rail board and they voted to endorse our recommendations for the design of the trail. Just like we've been talking about here, having design guidelines is really critical to what we can advance. And so these design guidelines were gonna be our critical on uh, entry. But, so we looked like, it looked like it was a victory. We were very excited, we're celebrating, but it was not to be, nope. Through some, some magical, um, you know, voodoo, the railroad official, uh, changed the rules and they, they adopted standards requiring the trail be located 50 feet away, which basically killed the project. So it was a deal breaker, but even as we stalled out on the Coastal Rail Trail, we finished that study and it was adopted by the federal government and as a result, we opened up hundreds of miles of rails with trails in uh, Victoria, BC and in Austin, Texas and Cambridge, Massachusetts and beyond with hundreds of miles all throughout, so it's, it was a really great moment. Now, in the field of planning and design, let me tell you one more story. In the field of planning and design, the greatest measure of success is seeing your ideas realized. You know, we do plans, we do studies, but we really like to build things. We really want things to be done. And as I was writing Joyride, I actually went back and looked through all the studies that I had, all the work I'd done at the city of Portland, and we implemented a lot, so I was very proud of that. But then as a consultant, uh, for about a decade at that point, I looked back at every plan I'd ever done and called all the cities and said, what'd you build? Where are the bike lanes? Where are the trails? Where are the walkways? And, um, and, I, and, and one of them was in this little community of Government Camp. Now, Government Camp is east of Portland. Has anybody skied at Mount Hood? Gone east? So you know Government Camp. So people at this point, the re one reason why people would stop in Government Camp and one reason only is to use the restroom. It was on the periphery of the town. It was a little Quonset hut, and that's why people stopped in government camp. And we did a survey, and that's what we learned. But this town had a vision. And it wasn't just the town. It was the whole region, which included the county and included multiple ski resort owners, and it included um, the uh, various federal agencies that own land in this area, the Forest Service and the BLM. And it was a vision that was to rebrand itself and become a place that people didn't just stop to go to the bathroom. So they um, created a tax zone and they taxed themselves and they uh, created a vision. And the vision included a revitalized downtown and a trail network year round, kind of like what Tim was showing, that you would have stuff going on in the summertime as well as stuff going on in the winter. It would be accessible by all types of people walking on or, or wanting to ride bikes or skiing in this case as well. To stimulate the local economy, there's such tremendous economic power in transforming your community around active transportation uh, year round, multiple modes, and they saw that and they envisioned that. In fact, I've been hired by many redevelopment agencies that really grasp that that's a way to attract uh, employees, it's a way to attract businesses, that that's what businesses want when they're considering where to look. They also consider, sure, who am I going to get a good tax deal from, where am I going to get cheap land, but they also have to be able to attract employees. And the type of employees that many folks want, want to live in places that are active and thriving and enjoyable, and this community recognized that as well. And so the results were that we designed this, uh, redesigned this little town with beautiful lights and hanging plants and nice sidewalks and trails and uh, a new bridge and the, actually the sidewalk would melt the snow so you could walk even in winter. And it's only about 10 miles of trails but really in the community, really tying the community together. And you add that to the thousands of miles of trails that we're working on all across the country. And so this is like the lesson and the final takeaway is patience and faith because whether we're talking about changes here at Fort Ord or in one of the towns or at the national level, it takes time and it takes commitment and it takes a lot of patience and faith 
to work together and to have these good ideas take root. You know, it's a decade, it's two. I know you've already been at it for two decades, and you're looking at another decade or two to get where you want to go. And having that two-decade, three-decade, four-decade time frame for changes to be conceived and massaged and solidified and funded and implemented is the norm. It's not the exception. You are exceptional because of so many things, but the time frame is really not the exception. And now is a great opportunity to leverage the changing legislation and the approach at the state level and, um, and to use that to the benefit of this community. Active transportation is about balance. It's about using active transportation to enhance Fort Ord and the region's econom economy and livability. It's about how people move in the whole area. And it's going to take all of you working together to identify and leverage the confluence of opportunities that are happening at the federal, state, regional, and local level. Now you're going to hear from my colleague Brian Jones Brian, later about creating uh, great communities through transportation by designing for people and places, right? People are what make up a community. Oh, I'd like to thank the Fortag people. I stole your pictures off the website um, because I thought they're beautiful. People are what make up a community. Well-designed places are what create the destination and the vibrancy, and you need both to create great communities. And not surprisingly, transportation and how we move and connect people with those well-designed places is an integral part of the solution. From what I can tell, um, you've got what it takes, and by that I mean you need, there are three critical buckets of human elements that are needed to, to make change happen. One bucket is political leadership, and there, this room is packed with politicians. <laughs> so I think you have the political leadership committed to these changes moving forward. Second is you need staff. You need bureaucratic staff at, in the various agencies, in the local governments, who are well trained and very well committed and very well supported by the leadership, and I think you have that. And third, you need the community. You need advocates from the community, you need advocates from the businesses, you need the community to be participating in actively the dialogue with the other two groups. So I think when you have those three buckets filled and they're working together, you can make amazing and magical things happen. So I leave you with a bouquet of flowers, uh, metaphorically, as you soar uh, through your process of following through on your dreams. And for all of your dreams and for the trails that you have built already and the trails you're going to build and the lives you're going to improve and the chances and the choices that you're going to realize, I offer that we have a toolkit of solutions. We have the solutions. We just have to put them in place. And we also have an endless reservoir of hope. A more healthy, safe, and livable future is within your reach. I promise. Thank you. Yeah. Can we take a few questions? Yep. Okay. Okie dokie. So we, 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 we started this off by mentioning Dr. Oz and Dr. Phil and the doctor's program. Now we have Dr. Burke. <laughs> uh, Mia's happy to take a few questions. I think uh, Victoria Beach has a few index cards. I got one. Okay, let's start with that. Everyone's leaving. Don't leave. That's a bad sign. Bad sign. Bathroom break? Okay. Uh, in one of my TED Talks, I compared the cost of the whole Portland biking network to the cost of one mile of, er, of superhighway. Would you explain that? So in Portland, uh, Portland has a network of about 300 and something miles of bikeways. The current bike coordinator, Roger Geller, did a a uh, comprehensive analysis of the cost of what it would take to build that entire network of bikeways over from scratch. And the cost he came up with was about $60 million. Now the $60 million, that sounds like a lot of money, right? That is a lot of money, in fact. Um, about half of that was just that East Bank Esplanade, the floating walkway, there's a bridge that goes with it. Bridges are very expensive. So, um, th and the, the, another big chunk of it was other bridge improvements. So there were some very spendy items in there. The bulk of the mileage was those restriping projects I showed you that were mostly just repainting. So the entire cost was about $60 million. And that is the cost 
of building one mile of urban freeway. It is. The cost of building one super interchange that we saw earlier, uh, there's one in Portland that is much, much smaller than that, did not have all those um, ramps and stuff. And they were just actually widening it, and that cost was $300 million to widen an existing interchange. So yeah, um, it, is, it is not free to build active transportation networks. It does cost something. Uh, it, it may be seen to some people as if the cost is high, but you have to put it in context of the types of expenditures and choices we're making about other transportation investments when you talk about active transportation uh, investments. Somebody asked about the Hawthorne Bridge Trail. Which one is that? Which Hawthorne Bridge Trail? Who mentioned Hawthorne Bridge Trail? Please tell us the story of the Hawthorne Bridge Trail. The bike, it's the, the sidewalks that got widened on the Hawthorne Bridge? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Okay, so on the bridge, on the Hawthorne, are you talking about the Hawthorne Bridge or the Burnside Bridge? Okay, the Burnside Bridge, because I've told this story before, the Burnside Bridge. The Burnside Bridge was a six-lane uh, bridge over the Willamette River with no bike lanes and really crummy sidewalks and no connections on either side from a bike walk perspective when I arrived in Portland. Very uncomfortable situation, and as, as you would imagine, really nobody rode their bike on this bridge, uh, and very few people walked on this bridge. So at this point, the leadership proposed and that we restripe the bridge with one, two bike lanes by swapping off a travel lane. And that would mean, instead of six lanes, there would be five. There was tremendous concern, as you can imagine. The media was all over it. It's gonna be Carmageddon. You will never be able to travel in the downtown again. Um, tremendous concern from the business community. But we had a politician uh, who was on city council, and his name was Earl Blumenauer. Some of you might have heard of Earl. He, he went to Congress in 1996, and he's one of the leaders of the nation's livability movement. He's very involved in smart growth and all kinds of great stuff. So Earl was on city council, and we brought this to him, and he says, guys, we are not going to hide and cower. We're go we are excited. This is the first time we're going to have a bike lanes on a bridge in Portland. So let's face the media and let's celebrate. And so we decided, well, let's do that. So we threw a party. We called it Bike Fest on the Burnside Bridge, a celebration of alternative transportation, kind of similar to the, the Salinas Ciclovia. So we're going to, um, we're not closing the bridge down. The way we said is we're, we're opening the bridge up to the community to come experience the bridge in a way that they have never experienced it before. It is, after all, public space. So we... Um, the night before, the crews came out, restriped the bike lanes, and then the next day, um, the local bicycling uh, club, the wheel, local wheelman club, came and started, I uh, had group rides, and they started arriving on the bridge, and we had um, booths set up, and we had information and bike maps and stuff like that. We had bands, we had food, and by, and we really didn't know what to expect, because Portland had never done anything like this before. By noon, there were 10,000 people on the bridge, 10,000 people, and you could literally feel the bridge groaning under the weight of all those people because 10,000 people weighs more than the cars that could fit on the bridge. Um, and it was like the bridge was getting a massage, like a foot massage, like a big foot massage. It was like, ooh, this feels good. It's great. And so we learned something that day. It was really a true lesson that um, I impart upon you, which is that it's, the infrastructure is really important. We need to have it, okay? Because people are not going to bike or walk if we don't have safe places for them to bike or walk. People are not going to take transit if there is no transit. But once we've put in the bikeway infrastructure, it doesn't end there. It is our jobs to encourage people to discover the delight of using the infrastructure and to help them uh, incorporate bicycling and walking into their daily lives. And so things like the Ciclovia and Salinas and what I hope are other activities here over time, uh, Safe Routes to School being one of them, but all kinds of events. It's not, it's not like you do it once and it's done. It's an ongoing part of the job in terms of making change happen. Okay, uh, next question is, how do you, please provide the pros and cons for tourist impacts, benefits for ecotourism, and people who come 
to ecologically oriented communities to live a lifestyle choice. The pros and cons. Okay, first I want to ask who in the room knows what the economic benefit of the Sea Otter Classic is to this region? What's the number? How many tens of millions of dollars does the Sea Otter Classic pump into this region? Does anybody have that or has there been a study? 12? Just under 20 annually? Okay, so that's pretty compelling evidence, right, that it's a very positive economic activity. And that is, you know, I'm glad that you have the number. There's studies all over the country from not just events like that, but from uh, the, the trail itself, say what kinds of economic development were spurred. And, um, and, and you mentioned earlier the Katy Trail in Dallas, although the Katy Trail itself has not, like, transform Dallas, Texas. It has, in fact, attracted a tremendous amount of development and is extremely desirable to be located on the Katy Trail uh, in Dallas, and it is, it is important. And we see that all over the country as well, that there are lots and lots and lots of studies that reflect that the investment in active transportation is an incredible payoff. It pays off very quickly, and it results in benefits that are multi-pronged. It's a whole suite of benefits. It is the economic development of attracting development in proximity to trails or bicycle boulevards or cycle tracks or whatever it is. It is the jobs that are created whenever you build things because whenever, if you build a road, it's the same as building a trail. We gotta have people build it and we create jobs. It is the attraction of uh, industries that like to be located in places that are healthy and the attraction of bicycle-related businesses. We did a study in Portland and found that $100 million of local direct expenses and activity in the bicycle-related industry from four sectors. Tourism, so it was all the rides and events that were happening all year long, and in fact, we found that there were, on average, of 4,000 a year bicycle-related events, activities, tours, and races. 4,000, there were 11 on average every day all year round in Portland, um, and all of those were generating economic activity. We also found that there's all these service around bikes, you know, there's bike sales, there's bike rentals, there's manufacturing, and then there's professional services. And so all those industries ended up forming kind of a cluster. When we presented that information to the development agency in Portland, a real light bulb went off. They went, oh, this is a cluster. It's like if we're investing in apparel as an industry, or electronics as an industry, or you know, agriculture as an industry. This is an industry. And so they set aside funding in the budget and they started investing in attracting businesses to move to Portland, which, you know, that went national. We got all the way to the New York Times and in kind of press around that, which meant more businesses relocated in Portland. So it really had a profound impact. So basically, I would say it's profound. The impact of investing in active transportation has a, a tremendous payoff and very, very quickly. And people who are ecologically oriented in communities to live a, a lifestyle choice, um, you know, I, I don't find that we are looking at a completely car-free society. I think that's, a, um, that's not a particularly practical goal. Um, you know, we're looking at a car-light society where we make fewer trips by cars, where we have a, a toolbox, and in our toolbox are different modes of transportation that we take out depending on the trip. And we become people, instead of becoming a bicyclist, or a motorist, or a pedestrian, or a bus rider. We become people who ride bicycles, and drive, and walk, and take transit, depending on the trip. Uh, and that is where many of our communities, whether they be urban, or suburban, or sub-rural, are all moving towards is a slightly less dependence on the car uh, for our daily transportation needs and our recreation needs. And the difference just a small percentage can make is phenomenal. In the transit world, they spend billions to get mode share shift of like 1%, 2%. And in Portland, we've been able to go grow the numbers from less than 1% of people bicycling to work to about 8% of people bicycling to work and almost 30% of people in many of the neighborhoods who bicycle at least part of the time, some of the time, and are living that car light Lifestyle and that for an investment of that one mile of urban freeway, not a bad payback. Okay, let's see. It seems that the bureau, how am I doing on time? Should I take one more, two more? It seems that the bureaucratic impediments to creating active transportation networks are disproportionately larger than those associated with traditional roads and highways. Will they be ever be on a level playing field bureaucratically? What do you think? Yeah, we've made a lot of progress, you guys. And again, you kind of have to 
you have to be in it for a long time to see where we're at. So I started in 1990, my, my whole career has been in this, so that kind of tells you my age, but it's, you know, since 1990, roughly. And the 1993 was the first time that the federal government adopted transportation spending rules that allowed for any spending on bicycling and walking as part of transportation projects and also set aside specific pots of fundings that had to be used. Some states didn't choose at that time to, they, they didn't do it, they blew off the rules or they twisted the rules and, um, and so it's only been, so it's 22 years that we've even been able to do any of it at all. So I think we're making tremendous progress given that. I think, and I have seen a sea change, I'll tell you. I mean, it used to be that I would, you know, I, would, I, I was the only person in the transportation department, the only person on a consulting team that was, you know, kind of going, you guys, you're showing me a plan for this highway or roadway and you've got nothing for bicyclists and pedestrians. It's horrible. And I'd spend the whole time just fighting against something. Now, um, it's the opposite. You know, the whole team is, not, is engaged. The whole team is trained. The whole team gets out on bike at some point. Many of the engineers are um, bicycle riders at some point in their, their lives as well. Many people in jurisdictions are being trained or retrained. Um, I'm, I, I think it's at multiple levels too. So you have to realize, I, uh, I, I, was, uh, I set up this institute that you mentioned at Portland State University. It's called the Initiative for Bicycle and Pedestrian Innovation. I started teaching there in the year 2000. And I uh, was teaching in the urban planning program. And I taught one of the country's first classes on uh, bicycling and walking and urban planning. There really, there wasn't much out there. There just weren't, weren't any professors teaching this. And so my class was very practical because I'm not an academic. It was really more about what we did in Portland. And it was a very popular class. People loved it. It was very interesting, of course. And I told these stories, in fact, which formed the book. So, um, but the reason I did that is that I started realizing, and quickly through that class, that what we've got is a situation where, the, remember that 100 years of auto-centric thinking. So that means the transportation departments and consulting firms, engineering firms, are filled with people who have been trained to think and do a certain thing. And that was for 100 years to move people by people and goods by motor vehicles as safely and efficiently as possible. That was their job. And frankly, they were very good at it. Um, and so now we're coming in and saying, OK, now we have a different set of goals. And that's about balanced transportation, sustainable transportation, active transportation. But all the rules are set up to, um, to move cars efficiently and safely. And the training is out there. So I realized we have to start all the way back at the university level. So that engineers, when they come out of school, because engineers at that time coming out of school, engineers, planners, landscape architects, architects, they're going into transportation departments and into consulting firms who are all trained this certain way. And so they're getting reinforced. Not only did they not learn anything in college, but now about bicycling and walking and transit, but now they're getting reinforced. So we have to start back here at the college level. So we created this institute at Portland State to start redefining the, the teachings around for the engineers. And so I, th I frankly, we're making tremendous progress, and I can, I can tell you that because almost every major city has a bike plan, has an active transportation plan, has an active transportation coordinator, has staff that are dedicated to it. Many universities now have um, classes and programs. Uh, the world is changing, and I think it's catching up, and I think that you know, maybe it'll take another generation before it's a completely rebalanced kind of way of thinking, but we are making tremendous progress.